chapter number 3, Proverbs chapter 3. Hallelujah. See, you're looking at how your financial life goes on year after year with prosperity left, right and center. That's God's plan for His children. That's God's plan. I'm showing you God's plan. Hallelujah. Showing you God's plan. All right. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. He says, Honor the Lord. What does it mean by honor? Give Him the right of way. He is the one that has authority in your life. You have to give Him the recognition of His real position. Who is He to you? Praise God. He's got a right to speak concerning your finances. Look at it. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Honor Him with your substance, with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all thine increase. Of all thine increase. Now, let me make a little explanation here because sometimes the people don't understand this. The first fruit of all thine increase. Some people are wondering, what does it mean? Now, if you get a new job, for example, you get a new job, your first salary package belongs to God. If you've been on a job and you get a promotion, your increase, the difference on your increase between what you had before and what you have now, the first of it that you receive belongs to God. Now, there are people who have asked the question, is it all of that first salary when you have an increase and you're blessed to God that way? Is it all of it or just the difference? First of all, give the difference to God. Secondly, if your heart begins to wander, give Him everything. You know why? <laughs> you cannot outgive God. When I have to start wondering what to give to God, I figure I, I've got to do the bigger one. Because remember, He'll always do better than you. Because look what He says here. Watch. Let's read verse 9 again. Because we haven't, we, we're not through yet. He says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. Did you notice it's not a full stop at the end of verse 9? Is that a full stop? No! We've got something more. Verse 10 is directly connected to verse 9. He says, So shall thy bands be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So shall thy bands. That's, that's where your store thinks. If it's money, that's the bank account. Because that's where you store money. He says, so shall your account burst out. Glory to God. Fool. Loaded. I'm loaded. I tell people, well, I'm loaded. I'm not afraid or ashamed to say I'm loaded. I'm loaded. And I've been loaded a long, long time. Why? Because I know about these things. But you know, we, we, we can't preach them every week. <laughs> Are you hearing me? We, we can't preach them every week. Now you say, well, I don't believe it. It's just another way of the pastor getting something. Okay, when you didn't give it, I was still me. And I was doing fine. You know, trying, you know can I show you something? Do you want to see something? Can I really show it to you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. All right. Book of Numbers. Chapter 18. I, 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 I need to show you this. You see, when you give, understand your prosperity. Hey, let me put it this way. Look up for a moment. You know, I told you earlier, we are born of God's Word. Yet the Word of God tells us to be established in the Word. It's one thing to be born of God's Word. It's another thing to be established in it. Alright? Now, we are all God's people. 
in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us God spoke to the children of Israel and said, I will make you a kingdom of priests. You're all going to be priests. And God, yet He raised priests for these priests. In the New Testament, the Bible says we are kings and priests unto God. Every one of you is a priest, but not, hear this, every one of you is a priest. But then, you are not priests unto one another. He made you priests for the sake of the world. And then gave you priests to minister unto you. Hey. Mm, 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 mm. Before we go to Numbers, may we look at the visions, book of the visions. Are you ready? Sure you're with me? You've got to be. You've got to be today. You are here with me. I have you right where I want you. Because when you start talking about money, people can't sleep. Whether or not they like what you're saying, they just can't sleep. The ones who like it, who give it all to me. The ones who don't, who have a hard time, they can't sleep. So nobody's sleeping. This is one meeting I haven't found anybody sleeping yet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I haven't caught somebody sleeping yet. Even when you're talking about the Holy Ghost, some people sleep. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Ephesians chapter number four. Are you there? <laughs> Verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, not the word, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You see, God gave to His church, to His people, gifts of ministry. In other words, the apostle is a gift to the church. The prophet is a gift to the church. The evangelist is a gift to the church. The teacher is a gift to the church. He gave these offices, these ministry gifts to the body of Christ. To edify the saints. To bring them up in the work of the ministry. They are the priests of the ministry. They are the ones who function, in a sense, in the altar. Not just the altar because something is built, but in the altar. It's a spiritual place. Hallelujah. It's a spiritual place of reception. That's what the altar is. The altar is a special place. Every one of us doesn't minister on the altar. The altar is a special place, a sanctified place. Praise God. See, so, even though you are all priests, yet you are given a priest to minister unto you, to minister unto you the things of the Spirit. You are blessed, yet the priest is called to bless you. Can you see the kingdom? How the kingdom functions? He blesses you so you can bless the world and help the world and build the world and win them in. And then He gives you ministers to perfect you for the work of the ministry that He called you into. He called you into the ministry of reconciliation according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when you study from verse 18 and 19. Hey, did you catch it? Sure you got it? Sure you got it? Tell somebody, I got it. Praise God. Numbers chapter number 18. I got to hurry now. Got to hurry, got to hurry, got to hurry, got to hurry, 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 got to hurry. Numbers chapter 18. I want to read to you from verse 1. Hello. Say, I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. From verse 1. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. In other words, I'm going to hold you responsible for the ministry. You are the one that functions on the altar. You are in charge of the spiritual ministry for my people. That's what he's saying. 
in verse 2, And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy fathers, bring thou with thee, that they may be joined unto thee, and minister unto thee. Hmm, did you say, did you say that? The Levites minister who? Unto me? No, unto thee. So he, he, he is getting the Levites to minister unto the priests. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. Did you see that? In other words, when God calls a man into the ministry, he also gets people to function with him. Now, the, the Levites are sort of those who are called to also work in the ministry. They function in the helps ministry. They function as staff members or uh, pastoral members that are working together with that uh, God sent man in a ministry. And they are called to minister unto that man. Can you see that? In other words, they're there to take instructions from that man. To do what he's asking them to do. Praise God. Now he goes on. Verse 3. And they shall keep thy charge. Did you see that? They shall keep thy charge. And the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. They must not come near the vessels of the sanctuary or the altar. What's he talking about? What's he talking about? These are sanctified things. Sanctified things of the ministry. They've got to be careful. They've got to be careful. They've got to be delegated. When they get on that altar, it's got to be what they were asked to say. Nobody's got any right to come up here and say whatever I did not authorize him to say. That's what he's talking about. And when they receive offerings of the people, that's, that's just written here, when they receive them, they have no right to decide what's going to happen to it. They can't take count of it. They can't use it. They can't say, well, there was an urgent need, so I decided to quickly use it for it. We needed to buy such and such. It was so important, so urgent, so I took count of the offering and quickly sent somebody to go get it. It's wrong. I don't do that. You have to be authorized. You have to be told what to do. And sometimes, you know, that's what we tell you. You, you don't just come to the reception there and just say, well, I, I, I'm going to give my tithe and just give it to just somebody at the reception. That's a mistake. The right thing for the fellow at the reception to do is, is to turn it in, but you're even making a mistake to give it to the one at the reception. You've, get, you've got to get to a pastor that you know. Cover a pastor. That you know he. You should be able. You should be able to get a statement or something from that person that tells you gave something to him. Otherwise, you give to the wrong fellow there, and think it got to God. Huh? If, if, if you gave it to the wrong person, don't you think that just because you gave God has seen your heart? That's not the way God gives. Read the Bible. It's got to get to the right place before your blessing starts. Just because you've got the seeds doesn't mean they are, they are sown. They've got to get to the ground. Now let me show you why this is so important. You see it now. Oh boy. Alright. Verse. <laughs> Where am I now? Verse 6. Verse 5. Alright. And ye shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the order, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. And I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To, to you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Isn't that wonderful? He says he, he gave the Levites to the priests as a gift. See, if you're really called of God to work in the ministry, if you're called in the ministry of help, then you find yourself here doing all of those things. You are a gift. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? That's nice. Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given your priest's, listen, I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Now, watch this. Watch this. This is where I was going, and I want you to see it. It's so important. See, <clears throat> listen, listen hard. Listen hard. See, when you say an offering and you address the offering and say to the pastor, or you, every time you give an offering and you're giving to the pastor, I want you to see this. You are not trying to make the pastor rich. 
because you couldn't make him rich. It is the minister that is called to bless you. I show you here, it's big. It's big. That's why Paul said, we are making many rich. He said, people regard us as poor, but here we are making many rich. There is a difference between the blessing and the result of the blessing. When you see a house, a car, a job, money, all these are results of the blessing. They are not the blessing. The blessing is an unseen something. It's an unseen power. It's an unseen force. It's an unseen energy. It's an unseen cause. Something that just has the power to do something in your life and cause miracles and the glory of God to come into your life. It's something you do not see. You just see the result. How many of you have seen the wind today? You don't see the wind. You don't see the air. You see the effects of the wind. But we all need it. How much we all need it. But we see the effects. We don't see the air. But our very life is dependent on the air. Hey, come on now. Let's read now. Verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of mine heave offerings of all the hallowed saints of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing. And to thy sons by an ordinance forever. What does that mean when it tells you forever? It means it's in the covenant. So it goes on from Aaron and on to all those that God calls in that ministry to God's people that way. In other words, he says, I've given you those offerings by reason of the anointing. I'm using the anointing. See, I'm using the offerings to connect my people to your anointing. You just, did you, did you, did you catch anything there? Get this, get this. See, when you are giving in a ministry like this, what happens is, through your offering, you are being connected to the anointing. And that anointing that heals the sick, that anointing that pastors the people, that anointing that God has given here, begins to function in your life. It covers you. Look at it, it's there. He says, I've given you their offerings. He's telling Aaron. He says, I've given you their offerings because of the anointing. What does that mean? I'm connecting them through the giving to your anointing. You know, sometimes people say, well, lay hands on me, and then when you lay hands on me, then this and this, I, I just want this and this to happen in my life. You're making a mistake. It'll never happen that way. Lay hands on you a lot of times, and still, it's not going to work. Connect yourself in the appropriate manner. You'll be amazed. <laughs> Praise God. Did you read, did you read in, in um, uh, First Kings about, about Elijah and the woman, the widow woman at Zarephath? The Bible says God told the widow woman to feed Elijah. And she didn't have nothing. And she had been crying to God. And now she thought... Now I don't have anything, I'm about to die. And she had an only son, and she thought they were going to die. And they had just this little thing to eat. And so she said, well, I'm going to fix me this cake, and after eating this, we're going to die, because there's famine in the land. And God said, now you're going to feed the man of God. From what? Well, she thought she didn't hear God right. Before she knew what was happening, there was somebody at the fence. Who was it? Elijah. <laughs> God. I love what God does sometimes, you know. Elijah had been praying to God, Lord, what am I going to do? There's famine everywhere, everywhere is that. And then God said, now Elijah, I go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow woman there to feed you. And I don't know what was going on in the mind of Elijah. Maybe he thought there was a great business woman down there in Zarephath. And he went there. And he got to the face and he saw the woman gathering sticks in the compound. So he said, hello woman, how you doing? And she said, well, you know, everywhere is dry. Then he said, well, this is where God sent me. Well, woman, can you just give me some water to drink? 
Well, she said, I can't do that. And as she was going, he said, and please get me some food to eat. And then the woman said, uh-uh. I just have only a barrel of meal and I, I want to take that with my son. And after fixing that cake, we're going to die. Because there's nothing more. Elijah knew he didn't make a mistake. But this was one time he should have been thinking, what in the world? You know sometimes God tells us to do some things, and you look in the congregation, you're looking for the billionaires to stand up. God doesn't have to do things with billionaires. You don't understand this stuff. When God wants to fix something, He looks for the, the unexpected. This little one. The most insignificant of them. Sometimes when God tells you, hey, I'm going to make you give a million, you say, me. <laughs> you think, oh, now I've been listening too much. This faith is getting into foolishness. And God can tell you things. He can tell you things. So he's connecting you to the anointing. And, and that's exactly what happened to Elijah. When Elijah told that woman to go, he said, Now woman, I know that you don't have nothing, but you fix me the cake first. And bring it to me. Then after that, you can fix for yourself and your, and your son. That woman thought, how dare this man of God. But then, she acted. Thank God she did. Thank God she did. She went in and fixed it and brought it to Elijah first. Listen, she did it, but she was still doubting. Read the Bible for yourself. I'll tell you how. Read it, it's there. She did it, but she still had some doubts. So, here was, let me tell you what happened. So, he, she brought the food and the man of God said, Yeah, um, eh, eh, until the day that God sends rain, you're going to keep having something to eat. Alright, paraphrased. And everything went as the man of God said. But this woman was still, you know, in doubt. Then her son died. God knows what to do when you're doubting like that. Now, I don't mean when you're doubting, say, God, just help me to believe, make me believe. No, no, no. You already believe, you're trying not to believe. So, the son died. And she said, man of God, have you brought my sins to remembrance? How come my son's down here? In your presence? And the man of God said, where is he? I took him to the room. Then he got on that guy, thrice, and raised him up. Brought him again to the mother. The mother said, now I know that you are a man of God. <laughs> she should have known before now. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of God in your mouth is true. That's what she said. And I felt sorry for her when she said that. You mean it, it had, your son had to die for you to know that the man of God was true. Praise the Lord. Have you heard what I've shared with you today? Now, this is so important, you're going to have to do it. See, uh, let me give you just one final scripture because I've got to quit. Are you ready? So much more to share with you, but we don't have all the time. So, but I've got to read this to you. First Corinthians in chapter number 15. Mm. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is what? Also holy. Come on, say amen. amen. You didn't sound enthusiastic with that. You haven't even given the money yet, and you already feel like you lost it? Say amen. Yeah. Thank you. Because you're going to do it. Hallelujah. Here you are. I mean, you sell air conditioners. Go get the best one of them. Get the best one and say, God, I'm, I'm giving you this. This is the first fruit. See, the tithe, whether it was the best or the worst, made no mistake, one tenth of it. That's what God said to them. Now, the first fruit is the best of the crop. Did you catch it? Did, did you catch it? That's what you do. When you are tithing, it's a sort of insurance. Insurance. You know, God said, bring me all the tithes and all the offerings. And, and you never tried to find out what those offerings were. And see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. 
You never checked what those offerings were. Now you're looking at these offerings. This is free will offerings. There's a seed offerings. There's a fast food offerings. Now you're looking at all this. And they have their promises. See, the first fruit is, I don't know how to put it, it's, it's like the most important of them. Why? Because it's number one. It came first. It's the first offering revealed to us in the Bible. The first offering, apart from a seen offering. Which means, after the great sin offering, which is Jesus Christ who was crucified for us, now you have come into Christ, the first offering you are to give to God is your first fruit. That's the first thing to be committed to God. You'll be amazed at what happens to your business. See, we thought about the time, but we, we, we left the first one and went to the last one. Are you still there? Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> hey, uh, I think I've got to read this too to you. Let me. I didn't finish that. Um, we were in Numbers. Can we go back to Numbers? In Numbers chapter 18, where we were, I was reading something to you. All right, verse 12. Oh, can I? Okay, just mark that for yourself. You, you can read all of that chapter. That's okay. That's okay. You, you already understand that the, the reason for this is it connects you to the anointing. Is that all right? It connects you to the anointing. It's so important. See, your man of God is responsible for your prosperity. Your prosperity is directly connected to your man of God. It, it is directly connected to your man of God. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 44, Ezekiel chapter 44, look at it. See, I didn't say it is connected to a man of God. It is connected to your man of God. Now, that's very important in all of the teachings of the Bible. It's not just whosoever. No, if you, if you are getting fed, if you are being blessed, if, you, if God is speaking through, uh, through someone to you consistently, the minister of God that's appointed over you, then you have to understand that your prosperity is connected to that person. In other words, what he says about your life is supposed to come to pass. God is expected to bless it. Look at it here. Ezekiel chapter number 44, and I'm reading to you from verse 30. And the first... And the first of all, the first fruits of all things, and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblation, shall be the priests. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cast the blessing to rest in thine house. That he may cast the blessing. You see, what you need is the blessing. There is a blessing. Understand this. There is an anointing. See, God never anoints a pastor for himself or a minister for himself. I am not... The anointing of a pastor does not function for me. It doesn't work for me. The anointing of a, an, an evangelist or an apostle doesn't function for me. Are you hearing me? It functions for you. You see, the anointing with which God has anointed me is not for me. I cannot benefit from that anointing. Oh boy. I will be blessed by it. I'll be inspired by it. I'll, you know, all of that. And, and, and I'll be enlightened in the scriptures by it. But all for your benefit. And many people don't know how to take advantage of it. It's yours. It's for your sake. He says here that he may, that's the minister, that he may cause the blessing to remain in your house. That he may cause the blessing, look at it. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. That he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. You see, you're having trouble with your, with your wife. I got a testimony the other day. Uh, um, one of, uh, a lady wrote me a letter. She had had problems just before the finance program we had. She had a problem with her, with her husband, 
and didn't know what to do. And she wrote me this letter. She said, look, as if I, I don't know what I've done to him, once he shows up, the moment he sees me, I seem to irritate him. He doesn't want to look at me. If I talk to him, he doesn't want to answer me. That's the way she wrote me about the husband. And then they were here for the finance convention. And um, while we were all here, the husband came up here and um, gave an offering. And also stood up and made a pledge. Here, after the finance convention, about a week or so after, she wrote me another letter. She said, dear pastor, it's amazing what has happened in our home. She said, since my husband went up the platform to make that commitment financially that day, she said, our home has been like, we, like it's never been. We are having the best of relationship. It's so amazing what has happened to our marriage. And yet, the message was not for marriage. Are you still here? That's the way it is. That's the way it is. There's somebody who gave a car here during the finance convention. I got a letter. Dear Pastor, we got another car, and, and this car is the best they ever had. Not only that, my husband got a big business with the governor of certain states. And I know the guy. I cannot, how could he get such a business? It's got to be God. Only God could give him such a business. And I'm like, man, oh my. What a rally. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's a lady who, who gave a pair of shoes. said, I, I, I came up here and I gave a pair of shoes. And I got four pairs of shoes back. How? She received four pairs of shoes. See, people don't know. They just have to give to you. They can't understand it. There's an anointing that causes them. See, there is a blessing on you. See, when that blessing comes on you, there is something that causes people to just have favor towards you. You just show up. Maybe you're talking about, oh, oh boy, how can I explain this? You are, you, you are only just saying something about, oh, that bag is a fine one. Someone, someone is under a supernatural command to go get you that bag. Just because you said, I like it. I saw about a minister the other day, and uh, he, he, he just pointed at a car that he liked. He just said, oh, that's a good car. And another minister from somewhere else, another ministry altogether, who was not there, the next day sent him that car, brand new. The next day, he, he just voiced, see, there is a, there's an anointing. <laughs> Can you say amen? amen? You are there. Uncle does not remember you. Brother does not remember you. Children don't remember you. Nobody remembers you. This anointing cannot forget you. <laughs> there is an anointing. He will just cause people, he will bring your name up. He will show you in a vision to somebody. That's what the anointing does. Someone is praying. Maybe they, you have even forgotten the debt. They've been owing you. You have forgotten. They have forgotten. That anointing will step into that man's room. He will have no rest until he's paid you your money. See, we, I said we haven't functioned in this anointing. We are just dabbling into things. But in Christianity, God's dream for you is to make you a great person functioning with the gospel of Jesus Christ big time I said what? big time his word to Abraham I will make you great what is great? you may give your first name as great but that doesn't change it my name is great doesn't make you great you really have to be great in God's sight can you say amen? amen. What are you going to do? Look at you now. God has made me to laugh. And all who hear will laugh with me. That's Isaac. Am I right? The mother said it when she gave birth to Isaac. She said, God has made me to laugh. You that has not given birth, God has made you to laugh. 
and people are going to hear it. You've been married eight years, you've been married ten years, you've been married twelve years, you didn't have a child, but you are going to have a child. And everybody who hears will laugh with you. Glory to God! Can you shout Amen? You've not been able to keep a job. You are going to get the best job you ever had in your life. Can you say amen? Some people say, well, they don't like these. Everything is going to be good kind of preaching. I feel sorry for you. What do you know the gospel means? Gospel is good news. Are you hearing me? A sacrifice has been paid. The debt has been cancelled. It's been paid in Christ. Hallelujah. The glory should follow. Glory to God. We are now in the realms of glory. Anybody who doesn't understand that is not a gospel preacher. He has religion. The man died. And the Bible says, when he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When God raised him from the dead, we were raised. Hallelujah. We are living a resurrection life. Hallelujah. It's a resurrection life. We are not going down there anymore. We are alive forever. This life, this life, this life is in His Son. He that had the Son has this life. Glory to God. When that anointing starts working, let me tell you something. I, I got a little swelling on my, my finger. It came just a few days ago. And um, I, I, yesterday, it hurt so bad. And, and, and so... I got someone, what my staff, a doctor, I said, hey, why'd you make an incision there and, and, and cause the pus to come out? And she did, but it didn't come out. A little came out and it hurt more. I said, dear God. And so, yes, the night she asked me, is still hurting? I said, it's hurting so bad now. It didn't hurt uh, as much as this before. And she said, so, uh, she tried something, it didn't work. She tried a painkiller, it didn't work. And then this morning, she asked me again, how does it feel? I said, it feels worse. It's really, really bad. And, um, well, I said, by the anointing, I, I said it to myself. I said, by the anointing. <laughs> I said, by the anointing. So, you know what? As I held the Bible, and I began to talk to you, and I stepped down, I felt that anointing. And when I felt that anointing, I said, boy, the anointing is here. I stepped over here, and the thing just burst. I said, hey, right on my Bible. I said, what's that like this? I came back here. I just wiped it off. Thank you, Jesus. The anointing can't spare nothing there. Are you hearing me? It will destroy the cancer. It will get rid of the growth. It will destroy the tumor. Are you hearing me? It will open blind eyes. Can you shout amen? Woo, glory. That's what the anointing does. I said, that's what the anointing does. It will go through your system. Everything that is not good, everything that is not right, He will get rid of it. Go rid of God. That's what the anointing does. I feel it all over me right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go rid of God. Mm -hmm. If I don't quit by 6 p.m., you still.
nợ Cơn mưa chiều làm vầy vầy nhớ thương Giọt mưa rơi hay giọt lệ tuổi hờn Như ngàn sợi tơ vương đang tóc rối Mưa răng mắt cho lòng ai lạc lối Ảo ảnh buồn theo sức khói giận tan Tình trái ngang duy kiếp làm bẽ bảng Mong mỏi Đợi trong giờ giang nuối tiếc Đường sương gió bước độc hành mãi miết Đời phù du đâu ai biết ngày sau Tìm dư hương trong mưa gió nghẹn ngào Sau nhân thế muôn ngày sau vẫy gọi Tàn giông bão niềm đau còn đọng lại Chờ trong khi rượu vợi tình ta Ai hẹn đâu mà mắt đẫm lệ nhòa Thương ra giết cuộc tình xa vạn dặm 